Welcome back to another episode of Unscripted, the go-to podcast for those flipping the script and taking the unexpected path. I'm your host, Jessica Burgio, holistic life and business coach, author, speaker, and self-proclaimed high-energy hype girl. Each week, I'm bringing you inside. No gatekeeping here. I'll touch on proven holistic business strategies, powerful mindset shifts that have led my clients through massive transformations, and no BS conversation with industry leaders designed to help you get out of your own way to actively pursue a life of purpose. If you're ready to ditch the limitations at the door, hit follow and get ready to be activated to step boldly towards your big goals. Now let's dive in. Welcome back to Unscripted, the podcast. It's your girl, Jess Bergie. I got another guest today that is actually one of my current clients inside Unscripted, the mastermind. And we're going to jam today because she is officially an author now. And I couldn't wait to have her on the show to talk about this journey, but also to talk about her journey overall, because it's quite the story. And I think you guys are going to really get a lot of juicy nuggets that are going to feel very relatable in so many ways. So Desiree, I'm so excited for today's podcast episode. Welcome to the show. How are you? I'm an avid listener. So to be on the other side of the camera is exciting. I bet. How fun now. And you have a podcast yourself. So you understand the whole process of podcasting. I know you love podcasts maybe more than anybody I know. And when you say you listen avidly, I know that to be true. You are somebody that I met and I was like just blown away at the amount of content that you consume in a way of just always being hungry to learn more. And it's really inspiring because I've often felt people judge people like us because we constantly want to be learning and reading. They look at you like, isn't it ever enough? And I'm like, she's my people. She gets it. She reads lots of books. She listens to podcasts. And I think there's like a certain group of us that like, it's just like this unspoken thing. Yeah, I get it. But we had an interesting conversation about that. And I wanted to kick it off with that because I wonder if that story would resonate with anybody listening because it was pretty impactful for you. And it was actually really impactful to be on the other side of that conversation because I didn't know what was going to happen when we had that conversation originally. Do you remember that first call that we had? You mean the one where you made me cry within 10 minutes of meeting you? Yeah, I remember that one. I figured we should talk about that first because it was a pretty impactful moment. And for anyone listening, that is not the only time Jess has made me cry, but they're all good reasons. Like they were all emotional releases that I needed. I met you in Six Figure School and I was drawn to your energy immediately. We're very similar. We found that out. But I was just having this issue, which I tend to have often, is that I overcommit myself to a lot of things. I want to be doing all the things. I want to learn all the things. I want to meet all the people. I don't want to miss out on any second of life. And so just being in this state of complete overwhelm that it tends to go into the physical and it goes into your sleep. And Jess just said, stop. She said, stop listening. Turn off all the sound. Stop reading. Stop listening to podcasts. Don't even listen to music. And I started crying. Like that was all it took. I said, I don't know how. I don't know how to turn off the sound. Like I want to be learning. I don't know what it would look like to be alone with my own thoughts. I think honestly, I was probably a little bit scared to see the chaos that was happening inside my own head. Now for context, you guys, she is a mother of two young children. So like that I get. And I remember being in that season, mind you, I only had one, but I know what it's like to be able to get lost in a dream world of other people's thoughts and their creative visions and to listen to somebody and feel inspiration, aspirational, maybe makes your vision, your dreams even bigger, or you feel some sense of connection to that person, whether it's through reading their words or listening to them talk about something or interview someone else on a podcast. So I get all of that. But I think because I'm just a little bit older than you, there was a season of time where I had to stop looking outwards for all of the answers and start tuning into like, what do I actually want? How do I actually feel? What kind of content do I want to create? Who am I? Because people ask you all the time those questions, what do you want? And you're like, what does that even mean? Sometimes it's hard for us to answer that question, especially as a mom, as a wife or a partner. I don't even know. Half the time we get in fights about what do we want for dinner? And I don't even know what I want to eat, let alone what I want to do with my life. It was funny when I met you in that season because I felt like we connected on a lot of those same things that we love. Because I want to go full speed ahead, like a lot of people do, but you can't always do all the things at one time. And we have to often look at what season am I in? How can I really do the most with what I have? How can I enjoy some of this process, even though I know there's other things I know I could be doing or want to be doing or spending money on or spending energy on? And how can I just keep moving forward, taking the action that I know is going to get me eventually where I want to go? And I totally relate. And I know a lot of people that listen to the show want to take more action than they're currently taking, but there are things that are holding them back, whether it's financially, whether it's time, whether it's just not making sense to do that thing. Maybe you have a calling, you're like, I I really want to become yoga certified, right? That's been something I've wanted to do for a long time. And I'm like, it doesn't make sense right now in this season of my life and my business 
maybe when I have more time, I'll open up space for that. But what does make sense is to double down on my podcast, really have awesome guests on, pour into my community right now that I'm building. That makes more sense. Not going off to Bali for a month and like blowing it all up for a minute. But we all think about crazy things like that because that is the entrepreneur journey. And your journeys look really cool because you didn't start out as an entrepreneur. You started out in a whole different world. So why don't you give us a little bit of a backstory because it's really important, I think, and a lot of people will probably relate to how you got started and how you ended up where you're at now because it's two totally different worlds. My mom was an administration in healthcare, and that was like always my dream. It wasn't one of those things where my mom was living vicariously through me, so I thought I had to. It was like she was my role model, and I wanted that. I started off as a CNA in a nursing home. I was direct care. People like to give me a lot of crap for that. But ultimately, I wanted to be in administration. I went to school for business, which in hindsight, you know, supply chain and marketing don't really help when you're trying to get a job as a manager for the first time. So eventually, I went in for an administrative assistant position that was opening up and I left with a management position. I was totally unqualified. It was a dementia healthcare facility. What we were working with a little foreign to me, but just the idea of managing people was completely out of my comfort zone. So that was where I got thrown to the wolves, trial by fire, drinking from the fire hose. You name the cliche, it was happening to me in that time. And that's how I started in the healthcare field. That thing that shall not be named, the pandemic hit. And that was really when my personal development journey had started. I realized I had a six-month-old daughter. I had all of these people that not only the tenants who didn't know what was happening, their families who were mad they couldn't come in. I had a staff that was completely burned out. We were wearing gowns and gloves and masks and shields and everyone was just completely burnt out and unhappy. And I was like, I didn't know what I was doing before this. How am I supposed to lead an entire company through this? And that's when I started reading. I think I read 100 books that year, 100 personal development books. And I've been reading ever since. Once you kind of start that journey, it's pretty hard to jump off that train. But COVID, it didn't break me in the sense that I couldn't come back from it. It broke me out of this cycle of letting things happen to me. That's a powerful flip on that because you left out one key giant piece that happened during that time after you had your first baby. You lost your mom just a couple months later during all of this craziness where you couldn't really see each other and you couldn't properly have your time. And I think when we get put under pressure like that, like you could have gone two ways. One, I'm done. The world's doing me wrong in so many ways. Or you took something that was quite like extraordinary to go through and you've come out on the other side now and you are helping people and leading people, teaching people through what you had to go through, not knowing how to be a good leader. And those people who do want to become good leaders, either personally in their life, which your book speaks to a ton, and those who want to lead other people and actually show up in that energy of being a good leader in management to help people grow within a company or grow within a corporation of some sort. Is that where like the premise for the book came from? Like not only to tell your story, but then to also then share and teach the lessons that you learned because your book is really beautiful and I just can't wait to finish reading it. You only gave me a teaser of it, so I didn't get to read the whole thing. Yeah. So I was pregnant with my second baby. And I got a call one morning that if I didn't have him that day, if I wasn't induced, it would likely be that he was a stillborn. I had a medical condition that they needed to do it that day. And of course, I'm in Minnesota, so there was a blizzard. So when he was born and his left lung never expanded, we couldn't get him anywhere. The fixed wing planes, the helicopters, ambulances, nothing from the NICU in the hospital 90 miles away could get to him. So I feel like that was the very first time that I had to use everything I had ever learned in personal development, in my leadership journey, in all of the things to be like, I have to trust the people who have the knowledge in this moment. And I need to coach myself through this process. I'm the only person I have control of in this moment. Long story short, he's fine. He's great. He just turned two. It was 24 hours after we brought him home from the NICU, though, that I got a call from my dad that my mom had her stroke. It was funny because he called and he said, mom had a stroke. And I like, your mom had a stroke? Like she was in a nursing home. It wouldn't have been that strange. He said, no, your mom. And I had a one month old and a two and a half year old. And we had to pack them up and drive them two and a half hours to the hospital that she was at. And despite the fact that COVID had loosened everything on the outside, when I got to the hospital and half of her head was shaved because it was a stroke, she had to have surgery. And that was one of only three times I got to see her. 
because COVID on the outside was listening up. But COVID on the inside of an ICU in a major hospital was not. They got mad at me for bringing my newborn. But what was I supposed to do? Leave him in the car? She passed away two months later. We did get to keep her for a little bit. She started to remember us at the end. She had gone through a pretty bad bout of not remembering who anyone was. But I'm very thankful for that time. Even though I wasn't allowed to see her, they had restrictions on how many people could see her over the course of her stay. I did get to bring my son Actually, I think it was the day before her second stroke. I got to bring him in and she got to see him and she knew who he was, which was amazing. And there's always a silver lining. I'm thankful for that time, despite how much the rest of it sucked. I was on maternity leave and no one was there. Everyone was focusing on my mom, which I'm glad that they were. But I was this new mom with a one month old who had just left the NICU. And that was it. That's wild, Desiree. Sometimes when you know somebody, again, we have this client coach relationship, but I get to watch you on social media. I get to see how you're showing up and I get to see how dedicated you are to really like serving and helping other people. You know, you wonder why things happen in life and we can spend time thinking of what could have would have been. But you speak about this in your book around excuses being the thing that holds so many people back from living a life of purpose and really being able to show up and take advantage of what time you have left and what you're really here to create. And though you went through a pretty unbelievable story with your mom and your son and just all of the things, it's wild to just look at you now. I'm just so proud of you. And I know you're proud of yourself. And I'm so excited for everyone to get to read this book. But let's talk a little bit about how easy it is for people to sometimes use excuses. I think you and I really share that ethos of like, we definitely have that empathetic side for sure. But we know that coming from that place of what was me and letting the excuses hold us back, it's not going to help us live this life of purpose that we really want to bring into the world. What is your perspective now on that look of things, right? Losing excuses as a way to kind of play small. I think you had it right the first time. You have to live on purpose. Life is not going to wait for you. It's not going to slow down. You're working out. You can hit pause on the workout video to catch your breath, but life is still going. You can't hit pause. And so it was probably six months after my mom passed away where I was like, why didn't I break? I don't understand. Everyone else seems broken. And for some reason, I'm still here. I can still see the joy. I'm still thankful every day. I'm like, why could I do this? And I think that it's because I wasn't allowing excuses leading up to it. I hate to say that I prepared for it because you never want to say that you're preparing for the worst. But ultimately, this is life like bad things are going to happen. And in a way, not allowing excuses on the front end where life was going great and smooth and nothing was wrong and I had never had one bad thing happen to me. I still wasn't letting the excuse of anything really hold me back. I was still trying to exercise and read and learn and grow. And ultimately, I found that's why I didn't break. I had built relationships that were there for me when I needed them. I didn't have to pick up the pieces from scratch after my mom passed away. And in between my mom's first stroke and second stroke, I lost my grandma and an uncle. My cousin committed suicide a year later. It would have been so easy to use the excuse of the outside circumstances to say, I'm done. You throw up your hands, you let life happen to you and just call it quits. But I had seen what it looked like to put in the work on the front end so that you didn't have to pick up the pieces. And not only that, you didn't have to do it alone on the back end. And that's what the foundation of self framework in my book is all about. It's how can you build a life you love with intention on the front end without allowing those excuses to hold you back? Yeah. And it's crazy because I'm trying to put my feet in someone else's shoes who maybe didn't have that full blown setup like you beforehand and who have often leaned on their excuses as a way to not do the things that bring them joy. And they're not in a position where they're choosing to thrive. Is the book something that people can look forward to really understanding your story and learn ways that they can sort of get out of their own way and choose rather than allow life to happen to them? Absolutely. The whole first chapter is evaluate your excuses. I had a meeting with someone once and he said, my number one goal is to eliminate all of my excuses. And I'm sitting there, I'm like, do I be confrontational or do I just smile and nod? And I'm like, you can't eliminate your excuses. They're still there. They're still in the back of your mind. You have to evaluate them. You have to say, why is this the thing that I say to myself? Is it valid? Am I not reading right now because it's a season of life that I actually don't have the time? You have to evaluate those things. Why are you saying the things to yourself that you are? And you have to mold your life around the circumstances that are outside. Yes, but you don't have to allow them to affect you. You still get to choose. Your season of life can, yes, be predetermined by things that are not in your control. 
but a lot more than what people think is within your control. And we can't let anything be a contingency on our happiness. Happiness is not based on any one thing that you do or don't have. It's something you always have. You just have to choose to find it in any given moment. You have to say, this moment sucks. This thing that happens to me sucks, but I can still say, at least I'm getting this out of it. Or I can still find joy and gratitude and thankfulness in this thing, even though, yeah, it's hard right now. And that's what the book is. It's about finding the mindset within ourselves so that we can shift from feeling like a victim in our own life to feeling like we have control and not only feeling like we have control, but taking control. And that's the piece of it. The very first sentence of the first chapter is I was 275 pounds in high school. This message is not coming from you from someone who's got their shit together. Sorry, I don't. Right. We write and we talk and we coach to the people that we have been and the people that we are. And that's who the message is for is anyone who feels like they don't have motivation Or like they have to do this thing in order to be happy. They have to be more confident. They have to lose weight. They have to get this specific job before they can be happy. It's to those people. It's to say, you don't have to put a contingency on that happiness. You can have it now. You can view these things that you're going through that feel hard as a learning opportunity. And that's what they are. Well said, my friend. So now your focus is helping high achievers become great leaders. You do that through your leadership workshops. I know you do high performance coaching. You are now a keynote speaker, which you've gotten under your belt, and you're just out there doing the work. And my question is, how do we go from working in management at a dementia facility to now giving keynotes and being asked to host these workshops? Where did the transition of the pivot come from? Because, you know, your girl loves to hear the unscripted story of how we went from being a manager at this facility to stepping into your leadership role that I see you doing now. I always said I never wanted to be my own boss. I wanted to go to work. I wanted to do my job well, and I wanted to go home and never think about it again. That was like the goal. But when I started reading personal development and leadership memoirs of people that I admired, I'm like, these people, the best parts of their day, yes, are happening at home, but they're also happening at work. They have the whole picture. Why don't I have that? And so when I realized that the work that I was putting in at home, the exercising that I was doing, trying to get healthy after having my first baby, the reading that I was doing, all of those things were not only contributing to a good life at home, they were contributing to a good life at work. They were helping me to become a better leader by having more empathy and communicating better and understanding the big picture, not only trying to please one set of people, but really doing everything I could to make it the best community, the best networking opportunities, make it the place to live for the tenants who are there. Like everything that I was doing was trying to look at it from the big picture of how can I be the best person that I can be, the best leader that I can be so that I'm adding value to everyone else. Mm -hmm. And I started to realize it's not just about coming to work and then going home and living your life on the off hours of the 40 hours or however many hours a week you work. It's living that good life the whole time. So after COVID ended, like I said, I wanted more. I wanted to do more. I all of a sudden had this massive amount of confidence that hadn't really been there before. And I was like, what next? What can I do next? What more can I learn? And I actually took a job that I lasted six months in. It was terrible because once you've done the work of figuring out what it means to be a good leader, you can no longer tolerate shit leaders. Isn't it terrible? My tolerance had completely vanished. I ended up getting a part-time job, staying home with my kids more. I was an events coordinator. Like I was networking. I fell in love with businesses and teamwork and the value that can come of getting to know each other better actually by further individualizing ourselves. The more we get to know ourselves, the more able we are to connect with someone else with no feelings of scarcity. We're not comparing ourselves to other people. We're saying, how can I add value to them? And in turn, maybe there will be value added to me. I fell in love with all of those pieces of networking and being in the room and meeting people who are further along and being mentored and coached by them. So then when my son was in the NICU and my mom had just passed away, I said, I want to try this. I spent the small amount of money that my mom left me on a John Maxwell coaching certification. And I never turned back. I think I lasted one more month. I had planned to stay at my part-time job. And I was like, nope, if I'm going to do this, I'm going to go all in. And I want everyone to understand that would not be possible in a lot of situations. I happen to have a husband who is also an entrepreneur. 
we have created a life in which I could just quit my job and do those things. I know that's not possible for everyone, but I do think that we are all playing a little bit small. I do think that we could all play a little bit bigger and really chase the dreams that we have without it throwing a wrench in things like we anticipate that it would. I do believe with every change comes a new set of things we have to navigate. And a lot of times it feels like resistance or it feels like, oh, see, I knew this was going to be hard. And if you really look at your current situation, there's plenty of hard moments you have to get through every day. They're just easy now because you're used to them. We get used to our bullshit and we navigate through it and we get through the day if we need to. And then when we change and we pivot, we forget that might happen again. And there's so many people I see get lost in that pivot or they want to give up too quickly when they get excited or motivated about a change and want to go a different direction. They forget what it was like to be a beginner. You forget how hard it was to step into management as a dementia facility and quote unquote, figure it out. It wasn't great in the beginning until you figured it out and then you made it good. And I remember being new in the beauty industry and not having a clue on how to get clients or how to keep clients or the client experience. And I messed up a lot in the beginning. And I don't remember thinking then like, oh, this isn't for me. I just thought, oh, well, I learned that lesson. We'll be doing that again. Even with the silliest things like cutting someone's hair too short and them getting mad and never coming back. That's a great lesson. I only have to learn that one time. We all know what that feels like to get your hair cut too short. So I always tell like really good jokes on food or like haircuts. But when it comes to life sometimes, and I say that jokingly because do you think the client was laughing when that happened? No. But when we look at business and we make mistakes or we try things and they don't quite fit or they're not the same because we're too busy comparing, because like you just said earlier, most of us don't even know ourselves well enough yet to discern what is for us and what isn't. And I love how you had the support and the ability in that season with a gift from your mom and the support from your husband to be able to go all in on a dream. Now, I know the backstory and I know it wasn't all roses and sunshine just because you were able to quit your job. You worked your ass off to figure out exactly who you want to be speaking to and how you can help them. And you're in the middle of your first mastermind also alongside me and you're killing it and you're enjoying the experience. And I'm sure you're learning a lot and you're actually living in your purpose, doing the things that you really set out to do. You started a podcast not that long ago. We're almost 2000 downloads at this point, are we? Have we hit it yet? And not quite. Almost. Yeah. And you're only how many episodes in? 30. 30 episodes and you've close to 2000 downloads. And I know you and I had a conversation about not knowing if putting that effort into creating the podcast and the time it takes to edit and produce it and come up with the content and drive traffic to wherever it is you want is worth it. And we had a really honest conversation around being able to just show up and do what you can in the season that you're in, trying your hardest not to quit because we know that even that teeniest little bit of momentum that might feel like a snail's pace is more than the majority of people who are going to quit. When I look at the fact that I am a one and a half percent top podcaster, I'm like, I would have never gotten there if I would have quit. Now, I've slowed down to one episode a week here and there throughout my last couple of years. I've gone up to three or four episodes a week. There's been seasons of my life where I can just show up bigger and bolder on social media, screaming from the rooftops and other times where I'm like, I don't want to throw this shit in the trash. And I'm like, great. And I stay close, like you said earlier, about staying close to other mentors and people who have gone before you to see like, oh, they struggle with this too. And they also feel like entrepreneurship is a wild roller coaster every day. I'm doing it right. And it just helps you know that you're not alone. So therefore, I stop the comparison game because I look at my numbers, even with my podcast and think, sure, would have thought I'd be further ahead by now. Kind of like when you turn 30 and like, sure, thought I'd be in a different situation in my life. That five, 10 year mark, we always have this arbitrary thought of what we think is going to be possible. And we negate what you actually are accomplishing because you're stuck on this stupid arbitrary number of success in your head. When in reality, when I saw that one and a half percent for me for the podcast, I was like, all right, then, Jess, like you don't have as many downloads as this person. You don't have as many episodes as this person, but you still managed to get yourself there. So your path looked different. Like who knew? And that's the cool thing I think about entrepreneurship. It's the cool thing and the hard thing because you and I are similar. Like we want to know we're doing a good job. And so I always want to know, like, how can I compare myself? Where's the comparison manual? And there just isn't one. And when you are kind of learning the seasons of your life, what you're meant to be showing up and doing and how your energy is meant to match the world. And you said earlier about just reaching back and speaking and coaching to the person you once were. It's a beautiful place to start and evolve from. And as you grow, that pool of people behind you will just get bigger and bigger that you can help and serve. And I see you doing that. And that's what the show and the conversations that you're having on the show are doing for so many people. And even me having you on this show gets me re-inspired to continue my podcast because hey, I'm human too. There's days where I'm like, 
is anybody listening? But it's like sometimes content and these sorts of careers, if you will, feel like there should be a different validation, a different kind of sense to it all. And when I worked in an in-person business, you could see immediately you were helping a patient, right? You can see the interaction. There was a lot of tangible, visceral. You could see if what you were doing was working or it wasn't working. But with content and with being an entrepreneur, especially online, sometimes we don't get that feedback right away. And so it's a totally different space to be where you just have to lean in and trust that you know who you are and you're learning more about yourself. And the more you put yourself out there, like you're doing with this book and the podcast, the more people can be drawn into who you are and you get to be more authentically yourself and share your story. When maybe at one time you're like, how is this story ever going to help somebody? But how many people have come to you and said, oh my God, thank you for sharing this. Like I lost my mom or I had this crazy story happen to me. It just opens up that vulnerability piece to connect with people. And I'm always a huge proponent of allowing people into your world as much as you feel comfortable. And I think you do such a beautiful job of that. And again, you guys, you have to check out this book. I got a little sneak peek when I was so graciously asked to give a little thought about the book. And I was like, where's the rest of it? Send me the rest of the book. I'm going to put it down. It's really good. It's well written. I got to give you credit for that for sure. But what is this fulfillment that comes through? Because I see your face when you come back from like the lunch and learns and the opportunity to do keynotes. And there's somebody in there that confidence is coming out and I can see you found your sweet spot. Do you feel like that right now? It's funny. As you were talking, I'm like, I probably sound really arrogant. Not at all. Oh my God. No way. I think a lot of times that as we're trying to build confidence, at least in my case, like I want to feel empowered and excited about what I'm doing and what I'm doing is reaching people. And so like you said, you don't always get that. So I think I've been doing that for myself a little bit. Like just you're doing a good job, Desiree. It's fine. But sometimes that comes maybe across a little, I don't want to use the word arrogant, but arrogant. And it's funny, you didn't get to see the second half of the book, Jess, but I have an entire chapter about the shit show that was like a good six months into my entrepreneurship journey. Like I had my chiropractor telling me like, I think this is good for you. It'll help you to be more empathetic. I guarantee more people will relate to that chapter than any other chapter. Let's just be goddamn honest about that. Everyone's like, well, I had a shit show season two. Actually, I've had a couple of them. It's actually the shift. So the first half of the book is how we can build ourselves, our value and do better things. And that's the part that started to build confidence. But it was actually when I was really struggling, that confidence continued to grow. And it's me having that relatable story that helps me to see the value that I'm adding. People don't come up to me and say, how do I do that? They say, oh my gosh, I've been there too. That's the piece that people relate to. It's very much so about our personal leadership, our personal values, and all the things that we're doing to be better people. But the second half, or I guess the last third of the book is, how can we be better teammates? It's about leadership in the workplace. My mom had a pretty interesting leadership story, as did I. And it's so close to my heart. I'm a leadership development coach. I couldn't not put it in my book. So the different types of conflict, one of which is artificial harmony, the one that most people could relate to in the fact that we're walking on eggshells. We're too damn nice to each other. We don't say what we mean. And it causes this, we're bored. Like we sit in a meeting at work and we're bored because no one is saying anything. You leave the meeting and you're like, I saved that hour by not going. It's not only us as humans, but it's us as team members and us as employees and parents and all of the things like my last chapter is called Everything Else because there was just too much that I wanted to put into this book and I didn't know how to fit it all. So the last chapter is 10 things that have helped me to navigate life and loss and leadership. And I hope that it helps other people too. Oh my God, I know it will. And I can't rate them. I want to go straight to the back of the book and read those 10 things first. Anyone else like a back of the magazine first type of person? I'm always like, let me start in the back because that's usually where the juicy stuff is. Uh, but can you guys see why I love her? Let's be honest. Honestly, I'm like, can more people just be dead honest? I actually listened to an older podcast episode with Lindsay and Lori this morning, and it was one of the Q&A sessions from the living room session that they did. And so a couple of girls were asking questions about what it looks like to pivot and when you're up leveling in life. And they just got really raw and honest. And one of the things Lori was basically saying, she dropped a couple F-bombs. I was like, that a girl. And she was like, I just wish more people would be more honest. And she was speaking about herself in the beginning when she was trying to build friendships. And like you call them teammates, even in your relationships, whether it's friends or intimate relationship, how many times do you not say the thing you actually want to say? And I know that we should speak with kindness, but there's ways to say the truth in a kind way. I'm learning. My tone of voice needs a little bit of help still, even in my 40s. 
But I'm like, what I'm trying to say is actually how I feel. And I think if more of us could speak freely, there would be such a drastic connection piece and, and that confidence piece to know that someone would still be your friend even if you spoke the truth. Someone would still want to be your coworker even if you actually said what you were really feeling. And I hope this book gives people permission to just start to speak up a little bit more and have more confidence. And I know this is something you coach to. I've never gotten to work in corporate or have a big team like that where we like depended on each other or had to sit through meetings like that. And I could only imagine wishing that I would have had someone like you come in and teach us all that, especially if you're like the person who kind of gets that the girl next to you doesn't get it. And you're like, are you listening to her? It's almost like you didn't have to be the one to tell her how to do it. Like someone like Desiree gets to come in and you're like, yes, we should do that. It's like the self-help book or the relationship book that you show your partner because it can't be your idea that we're going to work on this. The book said we should do this. You're like the book. Like Desiree said we should work on this. And it's people like you that are helping change the culture in corporate America and even in entrepreneurship land where I know the majority of people that are in your mastermind really are entrepreneurs looking to become better leaders or grow teams within their culture and their business. So can't wait to get my hands on the book, you guys. I'm going to have the link hopefully in the show notes when we can grab this. But until then, you can go and listen to the podcast, Lead with Confidence, where she helps focus and teach individuals about how to just be better, right? She's a very similar podcast to me around helping you grow that confidence and choose the life that you really want versus letting life happen to you. I just literally couldn't be more proud to get to spend this time with you and watch you grow in this season. You love Instagram. You hang out on Instagram a little bit. Is that the best place for people to reach out and say what's up? Yeah, LinkedIn and Instagram is where I hang out. Awesome. And when will the book be ready for people to grab? It launches on May 21st. And if you happen to get it in that first couple of days of launching, it's a 99 cent ebook. Like you're not going to get it much cheaper than that. So on May 21st, I don't know when this is dropping, but if it happens to be in that time, 99 cents for the ebook. And I want it to be everything. I told my publisher, I'm like, don't be nice. This needs to be the best that it can be. And she's like, This is one of the best self-development books I've read. And I'm like, stop it. You're being nice. I'm so glad you had so much support. We'll make sure it gets out in that time frame so that anyone listening can go just click the link and get it for 99 cents. The best way to support other creatives is to go and grab their stuff, leave them a rating and review. You know how that makes me feel. I love to be in my fields. I'm just going to shout it out. When we are here creating podcast episodes for you, it means the world. If you got a little aha or a takeaway or if you want to share something that landed for you, we love to keep the conversations going over in our DMs. So DM Desiree, DM Jess, let us know if something hits you or if you want to keep talking about something, our DMs are open. And thank you so much for joining the podcast. This was awesome to have you on here. What a little full circle moment, huh? I'm not going to let Jess get away without giving a little bit of validation here for her. It didn't matter how much it cost. I was going to be joining Jess's mastermind. Like it did not matter. I did your podcast launching thing. Honestly, I feel like I've used the majority of your services, your retreat. I have not looked forward to anything as much as I'm looking forward to this retreat. But Jess is not going to let you get away with anything. And I love that so much about her. And it might be because my personality is also kind of aggressive. I call myself aggressively friendly. But if you just need a hype girl, someone to hold your hand if you need it or kick your ass if that's the way that the cookie crumbles, Don't hesitate. Don't wait to pull the trigger. Just reach out to her. Make sure that you are in her world somehow because you have to be. Like, it's not an option at this point. You're the best. Thank you. I know we have our upcoming retreat on June 6th. It is a one day retreat that we are hosting in Scottsdale. We do have ticket sales open now. So if you guys want more information, you can scroll down, check that link below. It is the unscripted live retreat. It's going to be amazing. The group from the mastermind will be there as well. So there's seven of those women that will be joining in. They get to have their retreat ahead of that one and then join us for that one day as well. So lots of good magic going to be happening. A little bit feminine energy in the morning, dropping into masculine, getting shit done in your business, finding accountability partners and having those conversations that sometimes you just need to have with the right people. Because I know many of us have great support systems in our life. We have friends that we can share things with, but not everyone has those entrepreneurship besties that I know are so needed in order to get you to the next level, get you through the good and the bad and everything in between. And sometimes you need a hug and sometimes you need a kick in the butt. We all need that. And so if that is your cup of tea and you like that, then cool. We're your people. I love you guys. I'll see you on the next episode of Unscripted. Thanks, Desiree. 